Good evening, everyone. I'm Mark Lodato, Dean of the SI Newhouse School of Public Communications, and I'm excited to welcome everyone to this conversation tonight. But before we begin, I want to acknowledge with respect to the Onondaga Nation, firekeepers of the Haudenosaunee, the indigenous people on whose ancestral lands Syracuse University now stands. Welcome to our Leaders in Communications series. This is a monthly speaker series that is designed to bring media leaders, influencers, and newsmakers to the Newhouse School for candid and insightful conversations with students and other guests. With a special emphasis on current trends and challenges, this series is designed to help students keep pace with the quickly changing communications industry and provide them with a connection to the professions they will eventually lead. The series also offers valuable networking opportunities and learning opportunities for our students as guests routinely visit classrooms or student organizations, as well as participate in the public conversation. And this series is supported by the Hearst Speakers Fund. Of course, tonight we have a very special guest, one of our own. Jordan Bennett Begay is the editor for Indian Country Today. She is the first woman to be the top editor of the 40-year-old news outlet. She is a Diné citizen of the Navajo Nation. And since her hire by Indian Country Today in 2018, Jordan has reported stories on health, education, the 2020 census, policy and politics out of Washington, D.C., and a lot more. She's focused also on the COVID-19 pandemic coverage, especially COVID-19 data in Indian country. Jordan received her master's degree in magazine, newspaper, and online journalism through the Newhouse Minorities Fellowship at the SI Newhouse School of Public Communications right here at Syracuse University. Of course, moderating our panel tonight is Melissa Cheshire. Melissa is the Interim Associate Dean for Inclusivity, Diversity, Equity, and Accessibility. Melissa, I had the opportunity to spend a little bit of time with Jordan today. She's outstanding, and I know we're all looking forward to your conversation with her tonight. Thank you, Dean Lodato. Um, it, it is a special treat to be able to speak to an amazing uh, journalist, uh, and uh, alumna, and I'm sad that we're not in the HERG um, because I, I wanted to really be across from Jordan, but uh, Jordan really wished for snow, so I kind of blame her that we, but uh, I'm really excited about this opportunity, so thank you. And I, Jordan, if you're ready, we're just gonna dive in. Yeah, no, I'm ready. Thanks for awesome. having me back. <laughs> awesome. Um, so uh, you were only with us for 18 months, uh, but you are a role model of service to your community. And I love in an interview that I read, you said that you wake up each morning thinking, you know, how can I help my community? And I'm wondering, looking back on those very short 18 months, um, you did a lot for your community while you were here at SU, and I'm just curious if there's one thing that stands out about what during your time here um, that you did. That's a lot of question. <laughs> I, I like you're right. I feel like we did do a lot here. Um, I know one thing I was really grateful for was um, helping start, or at least like just pitching in and contributing to the Haudenosaunee Student Alliance. Um, that was just like a small effort by a group of us just to connect with um, other indigenous students across New York State, or at least across the Confederacy. Uh, because oftentimes I think as um, indigenous students, we feel lonely in um, a lot of these big institutions. So it was just a way to connect and um, you know, reach out to people. And I really have um, made great friends through those efforts too. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, you did not uh, aspire in college to become a journalist. So maybe we can start a little bit by you talking about how you made your way to journalism. Yeah, no, I didn't dream about it. <laughs> I, uh, I felt like my dream was to be in the, um, in medicine. I think as a lot of um, kids, um, and I actually got my undergrad degree in athletic training, which is like sports medicine. Um, 
I really liked that I enjoyed it, but it wasn't suitable for the life that I wanted um, in the end. Uh, and so I really loved writing. And I remember in this athletic training program, we had to do a lot of like reflection um, in tr treating athletes and um, looking at injuries. And just because, you know, it's known that studies show that reflection really helps ingrain that knowledge. And I remember my journal entries would be so long, but my um, preceptors loved it. They thought it was very thorough. And I was like, well, I just had to think through it. <laughs> um, I know my cohort was angry as me because that was, I set the expectation. <laughs> um, and then I loved writing so much and it was just very science intensive. So I thought, no, maybe I should just go try something else and um, relieve some stress and give myself a break. So I signed up for this like media class and I thought from the course description, I thought it was like blogging in a video. So I thought, oh, that'd be fun. That's something different and I'll just write. But I got into the class and it said it was news media writing. And I thought, what did I get myself into? <laughs> uh, I was terrified when I read the syllabus because you know, I expected to write stories and it just sounded very intense and I went I approached the professor after and thought I told like I don't know this is for me I, I this is very terrifying I don't I think I might switch classes and she's like no just give it a chance and just give it a chance and I'll help you it'll be it'll be okay so I thought all right um turned out I really liked it um I liked learning about you know different areas that you know I wanted to pursue or just learn about um I could talk to people you know, I got out of the house, <laughs> I got off campus, um, I, you know, looked around like our college town and just really got to know the community. And I think I really like that aspect, just connecting with other people. Um, and it just kind of grew. So since my program was all like, wasn't, um, was really intense, uh, I couldn't really take a lot of classes that I wanted to. So I sought out opportunities outside the classroom. So internships were one thing, or just like writing clips, um, and just trying to be creative and on the side, outside of it. And finally, I got this fellowship with the Native American Journalists Association. Um, and that was after I graduated and I thought I wanted to go into public health or journalism, but that experience just completely, I knew in that moment after that like week that journalism was for me because it, I felt so good in turning out like an intense story actually it was on missing and murdered indigenous women. This was like in 2014. Um, I just felt really good to connect with other people and finally be in a newsroom where other people understood our issues and um, our stories too. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, when we were talking today at lunch, you said that you would likely be an Indian country today lifer. <laughs> and I'm wondering if you could talk to me a bit about that statement and um, how uh, this operation is one that you can already tell you have no interest ever in leaving. <laughs> You're exposing my secrets. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, I've only told it to very few people. Um, now everybody knows. <laughs> now, now everybody knows. It's everybody a good knows. thing. It's a good thing. Yeah, it is. And I think even Mark knew that, my my mentor, because <laughs> even in one day he announced the position is we need to start thinking about the future in the next decade. And I think you know, we worked very closely together um, at the start or this revival the revival of this um, outlet a few years ago. And I really just love the work we did and um, just the innovation and experimentation and also just the work environment and work culture. Um, I really enjoyed um, it. I mean, I came in, when you talk about, you know, I wake up every day and wanting to do something for my community, this is it. You know, we are public servants. We're out there connecting and helping our people in every way they can. And in a sense, you know, when we approach a story, it's always in the back of our mind, like, how can we make our readers smarter? How can we, you know, inform them and educate them? Or even like non-natives too, because yes, our first audience is indigenous people, but our second audience is um, non-native people. Um, so in the sense of a life where I hope to continue doing that, but also continuing um, innovation like on the technology side as well too, like with social media and videos. I mean, we have a broadcast arm, um, audios is something I want to explore and see if that's something that will work out for us. But um, 
I'm really looking forward to being a lifer <laughs> and just continue to try things. And I think that's the great part about it too is Oh, uh, that makes me want to ask about the last mistake you made and the lesson you learned <laughs> from it. Oh my gosh! Which also, I'm going to expose all your secrets now. <laughs> so you you can you can take a pass if you want, but I think it's helpful, for, especially for young journalists, to know they don't have to be perfect. No, absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, I think. I, I feel like I sometimes overwhelm reporters. <laughs> um, I overwhelm reporters because I get so excited about something and I throw a lot of things at them um, or I throw ideas and I I'm just looking for something to catch, but I don't notice to me as a leader, I'm like, and my brain moves so fast. I don't realize I'm overwhelmed unless they tell me or, um, you know, it's just something I have to be aware of. Um, so I, I think that's probably the most recent mistake um, I've made. There are many others. <laughs> I, I would say that that is like uh, the classic attribute of an editor. So uh, that you are self-aware about that, I think um, that puts you head and shoulders above most. Um, so I, I that, that is a good mistake to make, that you are aware that you have too many ideas that you want to pummel your <laughs> reporters with. I, you know, I feel so bad sometimes, and I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry, but, uh, and, and, you know, this, and it's just like the ideas are always evolving in my head. I'm like, well, maybe that, well, maybe not that, because so-and-so did that, and I'm like, well, what if you try it this way? And sometimes I feel like, oh, I'm, they're probably tired of me, <laughs> but I think, even just, um, yeah, I think that's a big mistake. There's other ones, but I think that's- Okay, the, just one is enough. We, yeah. we don't need it. Just, <laughs> and that's a good one. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm curious if you could maybe share for the audience a little bit about ICT's kind of history, its business model and its management. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for those who don't know, um, ICT has been around for 40 years. So last year was actually our 40th anniversary, um, which is just phenomenal. Um, yeah, <laughs> for where we've come. Um, so it was started as a newspaper on um, in Pine Ridge, South Dakota by Tim Gallego. And it was just focused, and it was called the Lakota Times. So it was focused on covering um, that region and like the Dakotas area. And it just started expanding. It kind of just evolved into this like weekly, um, weekly and national paper and coverage. And then um, it turned into the Indian Country Today. And then finally, um, it the owners um, became the Oneida Nation, actually here in New York. Um, so they turned it into a magazine and a digital platform. And it got too expensive. Um, I'm trying to run it. So uh, they gave all the assets to the National Congress of American Indians, and they're based in Washington, D.C. Um, and then as of last March, um, 2021, and then we actually have new owners, and now we own ourselves. So um, we formed our own parent company. I know, right? It's exciting. <laughs> uh, we formed our own parent company called Indige Public Media, and it is run by um, our CEO, um, Karen, Mich um, Karen Michelle. Um, she's Ho-Chunk, she's amazing. <laughs> um, and yeah, we own ourselves. And I think it's just really great to see that journalists can own and run their own organization. Um, I think it's just phenomenal how like a lot of, uh, yeah, and a lot of our departments are run by native women, majority of organizations, native women. Um, there is, and I really like the makeup of that. Plus you have young journalists coming in. I mean, we've hired a couple of interns already. We have interns right now. And we also have like veteran journalists who've been in the field a while. And we have people who are in their mid career, mid career level and just learning from each other in this space. And I think that's really beautiful, um, beautiful uh, environment to be in. And also we're a nonprofit. So that's also a new business model as well. Right. What, what is it like to work in a journalism operation run by women? 
I, you know, I never really thought about that. I think it's very, like a very comfortable place to be. Um, and I know one of my priorities is to make it safe for native women. Um, because, you know, I think there's a lot of instances where there's a lot of instances where I like sources, just people were very inappropriate with me and I didn't know what to say. And of course, like leadership, you know, back then, like definitely helped me through those um, moments, but I wanted to create a safe place um, for native women too, um, just because, you know, they, women are life givers. So we got to protect them. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So you started in 2018. You've had a number of different roles. You almost get a new role every year. You started out as <laughs> It reporter. pretty much happened that way. <laughs> yeah. As a reporter, producer, and then you're a managing editor, and now you're editor. And each one of those roles is very different. And I'm wondering if maybe you could talk a bit about the challenges and what you loved about each one of those roles, mm -hmm. because they all require a very different kind of skill set. <laughs> yeah. And also, I was actually to uh, the Washington editor. So, like, the beer team <laughs> and then the deputy managing editor. So there was a lot of like changes <laughs> in that. So you um, had a new job every six months. Maybe. Uh, pr yeah, pretty much. Um, it was great. So I think when I first started there, it was just me, Mark, and our, our former associate editor um, on the editorial side. And it was our goal each day was just to get hopefully one story up a day. Like that was the goal. And now we're out. Now we're probably have like, I don't know, six to 10 stories a day, depending on what the cycle is. Um, it was it was really fun. I, I will say, I will admit, it was really fun being the only reporter and producer because I got to go everywhere. I got to pitch stories. I got to go to Chicago for uh, the American Indian Physicians Conference. I almost went to Paris, but of course I didn't manage my time well and I didn't plan ahead. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I had to go to Seattle, Denver, um, just a lot of really fun events. And I think it really helped me uh, figure out how, I think it, it really forced me to um, think visually and multimedia for a lot of the stories because that's what we were really pushing. Um, our prior priority is mobile because that's where everybody reads their news. Um, so I was always trying to think in that time, like, what do I need to capture in order to make this really interesting, but to show everyone what's happening. Um, so I had, you know, I got really good with like working with two phones and figuring out this is going to work. This is not going to work. Okay, this will work for Instagram. This will work for Twitter. This will work for the story. Um, yeah, and I got a lot of just, you know, in-person interviews. So I, I really enjoyed it. It was fun. The challenge was there are so many stories, like there are so many that fell off my plate. <laughs> so I didn't get to do all of them. Um, and like the deputy, like the editor positions and like deputy managing editor, I feel like there are kind of already, since we we're tiny, I was, that was part of also my job was just managing and making sure the beast was fed. And I didn't know it now until you asked me, it was kind of always like maybe managing editor of storage and just helping people out uh, with their stories and editing. Um, I think the challenge there was, I think I liked it because I saw different people's like writing styles and how they would frame a story versus how I would frame it. So it helped my writing. Um, the challenge was really flexing my editing skills. And I laugh because I, uh, Professor um, or Aileen, um, Professor Gallagher, she would, I remember her in her class magazine editing, she's like, writing and editing are two different skills. And I was like, no, they're not. Are they really? And then it wasn't until I am here and I'm like, yeah, she was right. <laughs> well, we all say that, Jordan. I mean, we, we all say Aileen was right often uh, in the building. So jo join, join the crowd. And in okay. fact, we have a question from Professor Gallagher, who says, you know, welcome back, Jordan. What's something uh, that non-Native journalists can do to build trust with Indigenous communities that they cover? Oh, that's a really great question. Hi, uh, Professor Gallagher. <laughs> First. <laughs> um, not, I think, you know, I think it's just following, 
there's a couple of things. One, I think, you know, definitely learn the indigenous history because, you know, the timeline of American history is, is different from indigenous history. You know, our history goes way back. Um, but I think that will definitely help definitely learn federal Indian law because I think in knowing these histories in that law and policy, you're going to find a lot of the nuances and understand like why things are the way they are. Um, you're also going to get further ahead in asking questions um, because I can't tell you how many times I was in a press call with the Indian Health Service during the pandemic. And there are a lot of non-Native people asking very basic questions that I probably knew when I was like 10 years old because that's the experience I had and that's the education and knowledge I already grew up with. Um, so you're already, you know, like if when you have all that knowledge and you're kind of already moving ahead and spinning a story forward. Um, so those are the two things I would. And just like follow on digital journalists too, because they turn out a lot of great work. Um, okay, can you give us some to follow? Oh my gosh, everybody that's singing me out. <laughs> well, on my Twitter, there's a list. <laughs> okay, okay, awesome. <laughs> yeah, there's a list called Indigenous Journalists. I can you can follow all of them on there. Um, so I will put that as that. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Great. And everyone should follow you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I need more followers. No, I'm good. <laughs> so um, you're referencing uh, that particular work. Rem reminds me that I want to ask you about the reporting and the data project involving COVID-19's impact on Native communities and uh, kind of the broken public system that failed to keep track of Native deaths. Um, what an amazing piece of work. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can remember like when you first decided like this is something we need to do and maybe take it from idea to kind of execution and how the work that you had to continue doing in order to get that piece done. Yeah, um, so I think in March, 2020, it, of course, that's when the pandemic hit, but um, we, where I was keeping an eye like on the cases and in my in back of my mind, I kept thinking, when is this gonna hit a res? Because I wrote a story before that, talking to epidemiologists and one of them said, we are, tribes are not prepared. Like we are not ready. Like, absolutely, we're not ready. Um, so I thought, oh my gosh, where, where is it going to hit? So I kept looking and looking um, where, where it's going to hit. And um, pretty soon once one hit, another came in and another came in. And I remember it finally hit my uh, home on Navajo. And in one week, it went from like two cases to like 25. And I was looking on IHS's website and I thought, no, they're not keeping track of it. I think even before that too, there was like maybe like two or three cases and we found them on social media because the tribes put them up, but I was trying to like, we we're trying to, uh, I guess, fact check and see if IHS had them or if there was the same ones that they were putting out. Um, and IHS was, you know, it was just difficult. Nobody knew what was going on and, you know, there's HIPAA, they have to follow. Um, so it was really hard to figure out what, what was going on. And so I thought, you know what? Tribes are putting this information out for the public, uh, for the communities. It's on social media, it's in press releases, it's on the radio station websites. I'm just gonna pull this data and just put it on a sheet if somebody wants to know. <laughs> um, and initially I was like, oh, this would be cool just to track, keep track of um, just because I'm a public health nerd. So I thought, oh, it'd be really neat. <laughs> fun and not fun <laughs> to like see how this grows and I showed it to my um uh, our editor at the time Mark and he was like oh you should make this public and I was like okay good idea so I made it public we shared it and um I think what made it a difference in that is one it was publicly available data and we showed our homework and people um a lot of Native people were wondering where these cases were hitting in their communities or at least with, in tribal nations versus IHS was releasing that data based on the 12 regions and, that, and that's how they're structured. But people wanted more um, just because, yeah, they, they wanted more, they uh, yes, were nosy, <laughs> but also we're trying to be careful too. Um, so yeah, every day in our uh, internal communication, you know, there's drop, people would drop different cases happening and I would go in and update it every day. And then pretty soon I started calling people and just try to find a point of contact. 
Um, and finally, we thought we need to get to a point where the dad is coming to us and not us going to them because it, it was eating up a lot of time. Um, and it got to that point. Um, and then finally, Johns Hopkins liked it and wanted to, um, didn't want to redo the work, but like, you know, expand it, make it more comprehensive. So ICT partnered with Johns Hopkins. Now we have a map on their coronavirus resource center for everyone to see. Um, and that's updated and we have public health students or just students volunteering and contributing to that. Wow. Yeah, and it started Thank on you. the Google sheet. It's on the Google sheet too, it's not fancy. <laughs> Um, okay, well, there are like 400 questions, but I have one <laughs> I want to I have one I want to ask before we get to audience questions. So I can remember when you um, were a reporter for Syracuse.com as part of your fellowship. You are our first indigenous fellow. We need to we we should do more because there need there needs there should be one every year, but that's a different story. But so um I can remember you, us having conversations about how to pitch you going to cover Standing Rock and the protest. And, and I'm wondering, um, I know a lot of students um, really struggle with um, trying to pitch ideas uh, to um, media outlets about topics um, that are connected to inequities in their communities. And I, I'm just curious, thinking back on the Jordan uh, that was in grad school and how you pitched that. And I'm just curious how it went and what advice you would have to our students who like you want to write about their communities uh, and, um, and navigate those challenges. Um. I remember, yeah, I remember that conversation we had because I went to you <laughs> for it. Um, I, I do remember like writing like a three page like letter and are making my argument because I knew that it wasn't going to, I knew it was going to be a no, but I had to convince like, yes, this is a big story. Um, and I think I like threw in there like a dozen ideas, but these are like my top three and these are the multimedia elements that would help. And I mean, threw in like, what's the name population in Syracuse or in upstate um, and it still didn't go through, but it's okay. I still went and I just finally like had it and I went, I don't think, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think like now wasn't the smartest decision, but I'm actually glad I did it. Um, but I think for pitches, um, one, now that I think I've been in this, like just receiving pitches in my inbox I think it's it's okay to like nag editors because I miss something in my inbox all the time and I'm really helpful and, and it shows interest to me that somebody's really interested in writing for us if they constantly like follow up um, because that shows the interest and that shows that you know you're eager to learn and you know the more um you know, the more interested you show me, then I'm like, oh, like this person wants to write for us. Like we should give them something and the more reliable we become. And, you know, there's opportunity for possibly like a job or, you know, or an internship or a fellowship, you know, because now we have reliable freelancers. We go to like, oh, when we need, we don't have somebody in California, we're like, oh, but we remember those two people out there. Okay. We're going to, you know, we're going to reach out to them and see if they're, um, they can do the story for us. Um, and, I don't know, the pitches, yeah, the pitches are hard because I know I struggled with them in grad school. Um, but you were tenacious with the Standing Rock. I mean, <laughs> I think you were definitely a gentle pest, which is uh, what I think you're saying, you know, you know, editors are busy and so you have to keep um, tapping them on the shoulder. But I mean, you did write about it for, for, the, for the paper. So you're your pitch worked. Ultimately. It did. It did. Finally. Yeah. Right. I think it probably have a few stories in there, but. Right. Right. You, you gave them no option, but to green light one of your 47 uh, ideas that you, <laughs> that you submitted. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to take some questions from the chat. All right. Professor Lewis wants to know what stories about indigenous people are non-native journalists missing? Um, let me see. Hmm. There's a lot of them. 
actually, <laughs> there's a lot. I don't even know where to start, Elliot. <laughs> <laughs> well, for one, um, the entertainment industry is booming <laughs> right now. Um, so we're always looking, you know, just to see what's happening there. Um, of course, being a, in a midterm election year, that's going to be a big one. Um, but I think with even with all these stories, I think a lot of non-native journalists fall into the trap of stereotyping. Um, and as Nadja likes to say, um, they do make the bingo card, which you don't want to make bingo on a bingo card we have. Because we have a, we created, Naja created, or Naja is the Native American Journalist Association. Um, so they created like this bingo card for journalists. And if you have a bingo, that means you stereotyped Native people, um, whether it's, you know, calling them sacred or spiritual or having a headdress or um, talking about alcoholism. And, you know, it just frames frames that story it just that story is going to go nowhere and honestly it's not something I'm going to read because it just like makes me cringe um so I think that there's a lot of stories out there and I think that the there needs to be you know journalists need to hit the nuance of all of it and add context can can you remember the last story you read uh in in um some news outlet that made you cringe um, oh my gosh, there's so many, Melissa. <laughs> um, I, it's hard to think of you because know, I, never, I never finished them. <laughs> right. I like go hard. in, I go, well, I, well, I think some, like, well, recently, you know, um, so oftentimes, so we're, we're an AP member, so we're an associated press member, so we take their copy. So oftentimes we have to go in there and like go and change words, um, I mean, that's just one thing, or even just take out graphs completely, just because it just doesn't, it doesn't capture everything. It has no context um, to, so I think that's a good example of one. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So Professor Mano wants to know, um, first of all, he wants to thank you for um, being so generous and helping and advising Newhouse students over the years who have wanted to cover indigenous issues. Um, SU is discussing how we can better recognize and address the university's debt to the Onondagans in a more meaningful, substantive way. Do you have suggestions on how student journalists can advance that conversation? Um, I would first get to know the community, um, go into the community and just talk to them and build a relationship with no, like intentions first but so that I mean that's something I did when I got here just because Onondaga is even though I am native like I'm not I'm not Haudenosaunee I'm not Onondaga I'm not Oneida I'm Navajo I'm Diné um so I went in knowing that I'm an outsider already and it, it is going to take tons of time for people to like trust me and to build that relationship so I would just go to like games and just or lacrosse games or just go to hang out at the native indigenous student program here on campus. Um, I would talk to people, which is like no one just, just want intention of just connecting with them and getting to know them because I knew this was gonna be my home. So, I mean, that's doing that on a genuine level and going into the community and talking to people. I think that's a really great place to start. Um, okay, Professor Kamir says, hello. Okay, wait, that, wait, I lost the, there were too, there are too many people putting questions in the chat. I'd love to hear a bit about what it's been like to approach management, a crucial but under-discussed part of many, many uh, editors' jobs. Oh my gosh, I was so happy somebody asked this question. <laughs> I was gonna get it earlier, but I forgot. Um, oh my gosh, it, holy cow. So yeah, we're trained, I'm trained as a journalist. <laughs> I'm not trained, I'm not a trained manager and that is a whole different beast. Um, however, you know, I think what the training that helped me was Pointer. Pointer, um, Pointer had like this training for the, um, Women Media Academy. I totally butchered that, but that's the gist of it. Um, but it was probably about a week training and just trying to help, you know, women become better managers or better leaders, because there's a lot of things, you know, I had managers, but I just really think about it. Um, 
I have to create like a really great work environment. I have to keep on top of a lot of admin duties. Um, I have to know how to have a conversation um, with reporters um, or even like a difficult conversation too, or even with the, my supervisors. It's definitely, it's a, it's a transition. And I think now it is a transition for me still because I'm young and I'm a woman. So that's also a little more difficult, but I have great mentors who I can look to and ask questions constantly. Um, you know, I think one of my, one of my doubts going into this role was, I was like, I'm, I remember telling Mark, I was like, I'm young. Like, I don't know. I was just like really doubt. I was like, I don't know if I could do this. And he finally said, Jordan, there are many people around your age leading organizations. And I was like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> okay. Um, because I just never saw myself in that and management. It's just like, yeah, it's very, it is terrifying. It's a transition, but there's trainings and workshops for it. Um, and it constantly is, I think, looking inward toward yourself and seeing, not, not comparing yourself to other people, because you're going to have your own leadership style. You're going to have your own management style too. Okay. Here's a great question from an alum. Nathan Abrams, how do reporters' tribal affiliations impact ICT's coverage? Do you as the editor have a preference for or against reporters covering their own nations? Oh, that's an excellent question. <laughs> hey, I feel like the best questions are the, or the best stories are the ones where their own communities are covered by their people. I know there's like some situations and I can foresee some situations where that's not going to do or and it's going to be the responsibility of the reporters and editors to recuse themselves from it um, if they're related or if they're really good friends, you know. Um, so I have a preference for covering it unless there's like, you know, an ethical decision. And so do the reporters uh, make that part of the pitch or how? They, how they do, they do. Yeah, typically they do. And they're really, they're really great about it. They're, or they'll probably say like, hey, this is a great story I think we should do. However, I can't do it. Somebody else use it because X, Y, and Z. And so we're like, okay, we'll assign it to somebody else. Um, so, I mean, that makes my job easier. <laughs> so um, yeah, that was a really great question. Yeah. Um, all right, here, here is a question from a current fellow. Um, Adriano, Adriana Adame, what is the biggest piece of advice you have for indigenous journalists starting out in, in the print digital industry? Oh, um, a biggest piece of advice, uh, I would say, I always look forward um, so we try, we have this thing, think, um, thinking like, how do we spin a story forward? Cause the obvious story is gonna be told. And it's just like, you know, pitching in general, how can you make it different, but how can you spin it forward? Um, I think that's the big one because yes, the obvious story, you know, for example, yes, IHS is historically underfunded. We all know that. <laughs> I knew that again, since I was like five, but how is, you know, how is this like, you know, this issue or policy making that different? Like how can you spin it forward and make it different? Um, and the other one is just, I would just start pitching. If you have time, if you want to just start getting clips, um, not only clips like at indigenous outlets or indigenous media, but even at in mainstream or in others, because I would, you know, it's so great working with other editors because you get to find out what you like and we don't like, and you learn a lot of people's editing styles. Um, and it makes your writing better too. Awesome. All right. There is a very long question in the chat from John about COVID coverage and um, mistrust between the government. Do you see the question, Jordan? Yeah, I see. Yeah, I see the question. Uh, have you, um, you know, there's a hesitancy for people to get vaccinated. Have you seen any progress concerning getting more just people to get vaccinated? And if so, what it take to build up that trust? 
what lessons can be learned from your work collecting data over COVID to ensure just communities. Okay, um, oh, the next public health crisis. Um, I think overall the U.S. can be a better <laughs> have better infrastructure. Um, uh, well, I think a lot of you know at, at one point in time, and I don't know. I don't know about now. I haven't looked at it recently. Um, indigenous communities or native communities were actually leading like the vaccination rates. Um, be, two reasons. One was the Indian Health Service is like a system already set up, so they knew how to get vaccinations out quickly. Um, the second was, um, you know, there's a survey that was done by the Urban Indian Health Institute, and they surveyed thousands of um, Native people. And the number one reason why they wanted to get vaccinated was they wanted to protect their community. And that is Native people to the core. Like, and I think out of that sample, that poll they did was, I think about 75% of them um, around there, um, don't quote me on that, but around like that area where they wanted to do it for their community. And the third thing I thought, like, just this is like last minute, um, when I went to get vaccinated, I, 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 Native people are so great at organizing because I went to this high school on the res and it was like, it was like already set up like a fairgrounds. <laughs> like we have powwows, we have, we have state fairs, you have, um, or, or uh, fairs on the res. Um, so many different, you know, we have basketball tournaments. We're always organizing. So when it came time to like make action and to make this vaccine available in our communities, it was already done. Like people already knew what to do, who to reach out to. And like the messaging was so great because, um, you know, we knew how to reach elders, right? We knew how to reach them on tribal radio stations and newspapers. We knew how to reach, you know, youth. We knew how to, we were, that message and that knowledge was already there. And the U.S. at that time was like trying to figure out like how to reach people of different demographics, but we already had it. So it was great. Um, and lessons from collecting data. Um, uh, ask for help. <laughs> <laughs> ask for help. I did ask for help and ate up all my time. I don't regret it though, but it was, I spent hours, I spent hours on creating that database. Uh, and I don't know, like, you know, I feel like there's a lot of policy decisions or changes that need to be made. And I hope not even that data or even just this pandemic shows and sheds a light, sheds a light on all the policy policies that need to be changed, um, including of course money. So. Right. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, uh, here's a question. Uh, what is it like to work at a nonprofit? Are there noticeable differences in the org's objectives as compared to a for-profit entity? And does that manifest itself day to day? Oh, that's a good question. You know, um, Nonprofit, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I think because at least for us, our mission, you know, is to serve, is to be you know, a spacious channel and to cover the indigenous world. And because I think a lot of us love our community so much, that's already at the objective. And I think there's, I don't see a difference in that, at least. Um, if they're talking about being paid, paid and like that side of it, we are well taken care of. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, they are leaders who are setting us that, you know, infrastructure up, you know, um, really knew that we needed, you know, just to be taken care of um, financially and our health. Um, and we try to create a work environment to make that easy. I know as uh, now, like, uh, as a leader, I'm trying to make it more, make it easier to be approachable. So if somebody needs a mental health day, they can take that mental health day. Um, and I think even this pandemic is shedding light on that. Um, you know, I think even just this generation, this next generation of like journalists, we're finding more ways to lead differently than the people before us. And a lot of times those, um, ways are very unconventional, which I think, you know, speaks to our organization or very unconventional. So in the sense that people, what people think as a nonprofit, I don't think, I, don't, I really don't, you know, 
we don't fit into that mold of a nonprofit, if that makes sense. So. I, it does to me. Um, so, uh, um, so some gratitude for your general awesomeness and for your coverage of healthcare. Um, what thoughts do you have for non-native journalism professors, teachers who teach student, student journalists, native and non-native? Oh, um, and also about, even though we've talked a bit about this, um, also the, the top of the question is about non-native journalists covering indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll answer one first because that one's a little bit easier. <laughs> um, and I think we need more allies, you know, of course, we like to center like indigenous voices, indigenous journalists, because um, they are the ones who should be telling those stories. Um, you know, and I think like what I was saying, I think earlier today to someone was our, well, our little story list is just so long, like we're drowning in it, that there's so much to cover there um, that we do need help. Um, and we can help, you know, educate, but also it's going to be on the non-native journalists to educate themselves too. So that work, you know, it can be really exhausting. I mean, it's just one that I noticed even being in DC and covering, you know, these, uh, Congressional mem Native congressional members, I feel like it's so hard to see the needle move because they're constantly having to educate non-Native people. Like going back to Native 101, it's, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't, it's a waste of time, it's a waste of resources, even though a lot of people are open to it. That's just like something I've seen the past few years and being there. I think there could be more movement if people did had educated themselves too. But Great of course, point. easier said than done. <laughs> okay, I'm going to in interject one of my questions that I haven't been able to ask. Okay, your favorite interview that you've done. <gasps> oh my gosh. Okay, it was just one question, but I still count that as an interview. I asked Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau a question about the Trans Mountain Pipeline. And that was really fun because it would end up being spontaneous. <laughs> um, you know, it was just, you know, I think that was a moment like when I really tested my own tenacity that day because <laughs> I was so tired too. But I was like, no, I'm going to do this. I'm going to try to, but you know, who, but asking a prime minister a question, like, I, that was pretty cool. <laughs> okay. I like that your favorite interview was a one question interview. Uh, <laughs> it was. No, it's great though. That's great. So someone <laughs> else had a question about, so, um, what advice would you give filmmakers not trained as journalists trying to raise awareness about the momentum to close pipelines in substantive, not artistic ways? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would say go to the community. You know, I think that that's where a lot of like the, that's how, that's where the meat of the story is is in community because that's where you're going to find all the like I said the complexities of it I mean just the climate change I mean there's going to be so much complexities in that too but when you're talking about pipelines you know there are native people for and against it or just like in weird sticky situations where they don't know what to do but you're not going to find that out talking to of course all the politicians and the talking heads you have to talk to the people who are experiencing it all right. Um, so you've had the good fortune to cover two administrations. Um, any differences in those two that you've noticed? Oh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> there, it was. It took a while to find a contact person for the Trump administration for media. Um, I mean, I did. That's how I got into like go um, cover. Um, Justin Trudeau's visit, but it took a while to like find um, and to, yeah, it, it took a while. But then this Biden administration, um, it's been a lot easier. Like I've, I think, I don't know, but I don't know if that's, I could be both. I, I don't know if that's a difference in administration and like their the administration's um, relationship with media or if, and or if it's me having more experience and know where to look and knowing how to get around 
at least to get around and like navigate like who I need to talk to. Um, but it's been a lot easier now. I mean, I've been to now the White House half a dozen times and it's pretty, it's pretty cool. It's really cool. Every time I go, I'm like, wow. <laughs> awesome. So um, when you first moved to DC, it was not a city that you instantly fell in love with. Mm -hmm. um, what, uh, how, but yet you've grown to appreciate it. So I'm, I'm curious what about it you didn't like and how you kind of grew to adore it. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I didn't like how colonial it felt. <laughs> There's brick buildings and it just felt super, it felt very creepy and creepy in a sense because it reminded me of boarding schools and a lot of the boarding schools I've seen were very brick building. Um, and yeah, I just had that very colonial feel to it. Like very, uh, it was just, it, it didn't, it gave me all sorts of like weird feelings. <laughs> um, but I, and you know, everything's marble and, or just, you know, everything's just white. <laughs> um, but I grew to like it just because there's so much going on. Um, at least before the pandemic in Indian country, there's like, there's like a convention or conference, like every single month, there's receptions going on all the time. I could go visit with people and just see what's going on. Um, I could visit with students. I could visit, you know, just, just about anybody, people who lived in the area, you know, their whole life or who been there for like a decade. Um, and I, you know, I just started exploring and getting to know the area a lot, a lot more. I just felt more comfortable. And I think um, I grew more confident in just um, navigating even just the hill as like a female, like a native reporter too. Cause I knew like, I remind myself constantly that, you know, our people belonged here and we belonged here. So it got better over time. Now, now I really like it. There's a lot happening there. And I like being near the water and it's a fun place to be. <laughs> well, the one thing that was um, obvious to me from when you first arrived at Syracuse was how much you love uh, New Mexico and your home. And I'm just curious what you miss most um, about this place that's so important to you. I miss the dirt. <laughs> I miss it because like if anybody knows in Mexico, I mean, every time I go home, I put my feet on, you know, the earth. Um, I know there's something very grounding about it. And it's just a place where I get to be recentered and just feel the place I grew up in. Um, you know, and also I'm, I live in the city. So there's like not, there's no dirt anywhere. <laughs> um, that's, that's the thing I miss the most um, is dirt, sand, like everywhere. So. Nice. So um, uh, I'll stop asking questions with our time that we have left. So um, what is the most rewarding part of being an editor for you? Oh, that I can create a newsroom that I've always wanted to see. Oh. Okay, that is lovely. Um, so what, as a person who has a lot of ideas, um, what are the stories that you're excited to tell in 2022? Ooh, yeah. It's, um, and it's a midterm election year, so I'm really excited. I mean, we have, we're looking for a political correspondent, so somebody's going to lead that coverage. Um, and that's, I think, that's the bread and butter of who we are. Mark Trahan and Leah Chavez did a great job at leading that coverage the past few years. Um, now they're, you know, Aaliyah's our anchor for the ICT newscast and Mark's now has his indigenous economics project. So, I mean, that's just, you know, I'm really looking forward to somebody um, taking that further. Uh, the census, of course, is always a big one just because everything that's surrounding that that's happening um, in the pandemic is a big one as well. Um, and I'm always interested to, in, of course, climate change, but um, native youth and all the great things they're doing. Um, I can't tell you like how many times I say announcement of just young people doing phenomenal things. And I think, but what was I doing? Like at that age, if I was 20, what was I doing at 20? <laughs> um, so I think they're just doing great things for the community. So I think we need to, you know, um, keep looking at that. Again, entertainment's a big one. Um, so we're keeping an eye on that too, but the elections for sure. 
the big one. Um, all right, I'm gonna make sure that I um, didn't miss any question that hasn't been. Um, I like Regina's um, note about how journalists are too pushy and um, about the deadlines. Um, good point. Um, okay, there's Tammy Blue with Blue Wolf Kennedy, um, also sharing her appreciation. Um, what haven't we answered? Um, let's see. Oh, here's a good one, Brianna. So she asks, can you comment on the pressure for modern day indigenous representation in media to be authentic, yet balancing not being able to tell every indigenous story and intersection? People expect a lot from indigenous representation and it can't hit every aspect every time. Oh my gosh, that is so true. Um, uh, it's all about... Uh, but I don't even know what to say about that because it's I I just that resonates so well. Um, it, it's not going to be perfect, you know. And I think it's okay to make mistakes, and that you can't reach every story every time. But at least for ICT, what we try to do is cover it in some capacity because we have we're a small team. Um, we can't, you know, we have, you know, reporters have probably three to five stories they're working on at a time and you know and sometimes of course if there's breaking news that happens one of those has to like get pushed down pushed down and it's just all a matter about talking with them and prioritizing what's what's happening in that moment um but also you know we just find creative ways to like cover stories like the broadcast is one thing we have like our evening news briefs um that help of course there's social media there's um you know, there's just other ways to like get the word out rather than just a full blown story. Cause yeah, Brianna's right. We're not going to cover it every single time. I wish we can, but it's just very unrealistic and you're just going to burn yourself out. And I don't want to burn myself. I don't want to burn my team out. It's just, that's not, no, everybody's going to be super angry and upset. So I don't want, I don't want that. <laughs> so we, we don't have very much time left, but I really, there's a really, um, important question down toward the bottom um, by written by Chad Yen and um, I'll let you. Oh yeah. Oh, that's a good one. Hey, you are both alum. Um, okay, so <laughs> I'll, read out, I'll read out loud real quick. Indigenous people are confronted with environmental racism and social justice globally. So, what advice, recommendations do you have for indigenous or allied journalists abroad where reporting on contentious issues such as pipeline land grab or land encroachment might lead to life-threatening situations, such as in the cases of Mexico or Latin America? Um, safety is a huge huge deal I think you know do what you're comfortable with right and it's the same thing this co this pandemic too um if reporters not comfortable meeting somebody face to face in person then we're, I'm not going to push them so I think it's your comfort level I think that's yeah and it's it's that's a hard that's a hard question for sure um, I I agree but I, I meant that's probably something that you had to consider and have had to consider on stories that you've done. I mean, especially like Standing Rock in particular. Yeah, Standing Rock, well, yeah, for sure. Um, there's also the inauguration um, in 2021 after the insurrection. And yeah, we weren't planning to go, but then I told Mark and Katie, who's our managing editor at the time, I said, I have, for me, I was like, I have to go, I'm in DC. And if I don't go, I'm going to regret it the rest of my life. Like I just knew. Um, but I went there and my family was not oh, happy with me, <laughs> but I knew I had to go because I worked so hard to get to where I am. So I had to be there and I'm happy I went because it was actually probably a, a safe, the safest place in the world at that point. Um, so, but, okay, we only, I, I now, this is a whole new thing that I want to talk about. So tell me quick, we only have like however many seconds left. So you went, what was it like? What did you see? Um, it was, 
It was great. I saw we were in the I was in the media stand at the top behind the White House. I saw the whole procession. I saw Biden walk by Harris. Um, I had a weird obsession with presidents as a kid. So fifth grader Jordan was like so happy and just just ecstatic just to be there because I never thought in my entire life I would be able to witness history you know in front of me and that's one of the reasons I wanted to be a journalist was to get to write about history but also witness it um and to tell stories about it and show pictures (laughs) well I I we are so glad that fifth grade Jordan is still that's that is still alive in you and that you're continued to act on her her interests so um thank you so much for spending time you have to come back uh please don't ask for snow again when you so that we can actually be in the herd but it's so great to see you and i'm so proud of you and we we are lucky to count you as an alum so thanks for all you do for us no thank you too thank you to uh, the Haudenosaunee community too i think it's they made it, you know, very, they're very welcoming to me and just helped me thrive in Newhouse did, did the same thing too. So I'm really grateful for all of you. And it's great to be back. We'll come back in the fall when there's uh, apple picking, no snow. Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much.